Professor Sir James Merlees, Professor Na Ferguson, guests, fellows, and fellow students. Welcome to tonight's dinner. I'm Alicia Ho, tonight's Master of Ceremony. We are honored to have Professor Na Ferguson, our guest speaker for dinner tonight. Before we begin, may I invite our college master, Sir James Merlees, to the stage to deliver the opening remarks and to strike the gong. Professor Merlees, please. Just say welcome to, uh, to another dinner with the speaker. Uh, we will, of course, have uh, Professor Ferguson talking to us immediately after dinner, which I suppose is an incentive for us all to eat quickly. Uh, and uh, there will be plenty of time for questions and interaction afterwards. That's actually why I got the curtains pulled, because I think it helps the acoustic. And I hope that's going to make it easy for us to, to talk back and forward. Anyway, welcome, and uh, dinner will now begin. Thank you, Professor Melis. Please be seated and let's enjoy our dinner. dinner. Um, it's about time for our dinner talk, so may I now invite Professor Merlees to the stage to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Nao Ferguson. Professor Merlees. It's very nice. You know, we have this program of uh, distinguished visitors, and uh, this is in fact our, uh, he is our third visitor this year. He's already given a public lecture in the, in the university. But uh, Neil Ferguson is uh, certainly uh, oh, the, one of the most prominent historians currently, uh, and uh, in my opinion, a very good one. Uh, has uh, written many books. He started in Oxford as a student, and then uh, he became a fellow there. And he spent some time in Cambridge, Britain, and then he spent some time in Cambridge, the U.S., at Harvard, which is his base now. Anyway, we're very fortunate that uh, he's with us for these three weeks. This is the middle week. And tonight, he's going to talk about the West and the Rest, which is the subtitle of his book called Civilization. Neil Ferguson. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Jim. It's a great pleasure to be with you spoiling uh, your dinner. My objective here is to give a relatively brief talk that will aid your digestion. And your objective is not to make too much noise while you digest the more clunking of cutlery, the louder I become, and I will win. <laughs> what I want to do is to talk about a book I published uh, a few years ago entitled Civilization, the West and the Rest. 
Some of you may have heard the lecture I gave earlier this week, which was, as uh, Sir James kindly put it, an attempt to do economics, uh, with the emphasis on the word attempt. Tonight I just want to, to talk history, and I want to make a, an argument about one of the most important questions, perhaps the most important question of all, that we can ask about world history in the last thousand years. And I think no matter what your speciality, and I've met a group of students this evening studying everything from business to psychology, whatever your speciality, wherever you come from, wherever you intend to go, there will be something in this lecture of interest to you. And if you can find nothing in this lecture that is of interest to you, Sir James will give you $100 at the end of the evening. <laughs> so in 1411, or thereabouts, it was the Chinese who led the world. If you had gone on a world tour 600 years ago, you would have been more impressed by Chinese civilization than by any civilization you would have encountered in the rest of the world. You would certainly have been much more impressed by uh, Chinese architecture of the early Ming period than by anything that you would have seen in Western Europe. You would also have been impressed to discover that the Chinese had already invented golf. There are quite a few Scots here tonight, including the master of this great college and me. And we were brought up to believe that the Scots had invented the game of golf. This turns out to be untrue. If you look closely at the lower of these uh, two pictures, you will see, long before the game of golf was invented in Scotland, people very clearly playing a game identical to golf in China. Now, I don't regard golf as the height of civilization, though perhaps Tiger Woods <laughs> does. But it's a good illustration of the fact that many of the things that we take for granted today all over the world are Chinese in origin, from paper to paper money to matches to fireworks and all the rest. Chinese had a considerable lead in iron technology, for example, uh, in the medieval period. As you traveled the world of four, 500 or 600 years ago, you would have been much more impressed by Asian cities than by Western cities. The world's 10 biggest cities in 1500 were, with the exception of Paris, which only just made it into the top 10, non-Western, with Beijing, by far the largest city in the world, with a population of close to 700,000, we estimate. At that time, the population of London was just 50,000. If you'd gone from Beijing to London, you would have been startled by how small, squalid, primitive, and impoverished London was. What I want to talk about this evening is why, by 1900, the world had changed so dramatically. The, the largest cities in the world in 1900 were nearly all Western cities, with one exception, Tokyo, which was really the only city in Asia that was in any meaningful sense an industrial, and in that sense, westernized city. London had become the biggest city in the world, with a population of around six and a half million. Well, I talked about this the other night. In economic terms, this was the great divergence. From around 1500 to as recently as the 1970s, the trajectory of history was massively to the advantage of people in the West. 
so massively that by the late 1970s, the average American was more than 20 times richer than the average Chinese. The average Britain nearly 15 times richer than the average Indian. This wasn't just economic. I hardly need to point this out in Hong Kong of all places. But Western dominance was political as well. Here in 1500, there were around 11 European states that covered maybe 5% of the world's land surface, had about 16% of its population, and maybe a fifth of global GDP. These 11 countries, by 1913, controlled nearly 60% of the world's territory and population, and around three quarters of its economy. Then, exactly 100 years ago, Hong Kong was just a small part of a vast complex of Western empires. There were a dozen Western empires, 11 of them had their metropoles in Europe. One, the United States, was a product of European empire and had in turn become an empire in its own right, controlling at that time territories uh, as far away from the United States as the Philippines. In every way, Westerners had the advantage. They lived longer, much longer too. If you just compare life expectancy at birth in, say, 1900. In the English-speaking world, it was roughly double what it was in India. As recently as 1950, life expectancy in China was just uh, 40 years, at a time when it was close to 70 in Britain and the United States. So what we call, as economic historians, the great divergence was a divergence not just in terms of per capita gross domestic product. It was a divergence in every sense. Not just 100 years ago, but 50 years ago, in my grandfather's generation, there was still a strong presumption that the Westerner was born to rule over the Westerner. And I use the term Western as a deliberate pun because it wasn't just the East, it wasn't just East Asia that Europeans and Americans ruled. It was all the rest of the world. Why? The single hardest and at the same time most interesting question you can ask about modern history is why did this happen? Why from around 1500 until as recently as the 1970s was the trajectory of world history so clearly to the advantage of a minority of human beings and to the disadvantage of the majority? What's fascinating about my subject is that there are so many different answers to this question, but only mine is correct. <laughs> It's not a new question. By what means are the Europeans thus powerful? Or why, since they can so easily visit Asia and Africa for trade or conquest, cannot the Asiatics and Africans invade their coasts, plant colonies in their ports, and give laws to their natural princes? The same wind that carries them back would bring us thither. This is a great question devised by the lexicographer Samuel Johnson, posed by Rasselas, Prince of Abyssinia, in Johnson's 1759 novel, The History of Rasselas. And his advisor gives the following answer. They are more powerful, sir, than we, because they are wiser. Knowledge will always predominate over ignorance as man governs the other animals. But why their knowledge is more than ours I know not what reason can be given, but the unsearchable will of the supreme being. Well, I hope to offer you a slightly better answer than that this evening. Who has read Jared Diamond, Guns, Germs, and Steel? Put your hand up if you know that book. Okay, so if you haven't read it, 
tomorrow you've got to go to the university bookstore and buy that book as well as my book. <laughs> Never let it be said that I'm selfish. Jared Diamond is one of those scholars who's attempted to explain the Great Divergence, but in terms mainly of geography. The reason that I'm skeptical about the role of geography is that, well, geography doesn't change that much over time. It's not that different in the year zero from the geography we know today. Or, let me put it differently. Imagine running an experiment. Let's take two countries with people who are essentially the same, located in essentially the same places. Let's divide those countries in half. And let's give one half communist institutions and the other half capitalist institutions. And let's see what happens. So we ran this experiment in Germany after World War II. And you can see the result in this picture because what happened was that within a very short space of time, East Germans began to produce cars like the one you see on the left, and West Germans continued to produce cars like the one that you see on the right. They were still all in Germany. The geography hadn't changed. And they were still all Germans. The nationality hadn't changed. What had changed was the institutions. As I speak, a crisis, a very acute crisis, is unfolding on the Korean Peninsula. It's actually a really worrying one, much more serious than anything we've seen in, in recent years. But the Korean Peninsula is another example of what I'm talking about. It's the same experiment conducted in roughly the same time frame, except unfortunately, this experiment isn't over. And what you see, once again, is that institutions, if you change them, have very profound consequences, even if geography and national character are held constant. Experiments like these are not very pleasant for the people who are forced to live in the communist part of the country, but for historians, they're very illuminating. And they're one of a whole bunch of reasons why I think institutions matter more than geography or national character, much less the thing that, of course, 100 years ago, people mainly talked about. Remember, 100 years ago, most people assumed that white Europeans and North Americans had an innate superiority over everybody else. That theory has long been discredited. But it is, in fact, no more or no less compelling than geographical explanations or explanations based on national character. So what is the answer? Why did the West get so much richer, stronger, and healthier than the rest? Well, I want to suggest a simple six-part answer which focuses on institutions. The first argument that I want to make has to do with, in particular, urban institutions. This picture here shows the Guildhall in London, the home of the corporation of the city of London. The word corporation is an interesting word in its own right. What it tells you is that in already medieval 12th century England, it was entirely legitimate that the merchants, the businessmen of London, should be a self-governing corporate body. This is a college. It's modeled on the colleges of Oxford and Cambridge, the most ancient universities of England. Those two were self-governing entities in their original form. The characteristic feature of Western institutions in the medieval period was the extent to which power was devolved to self-governing corporate entities in every sphere, in the sphere of business, in the sphere of education, even in the sphere of religion. Compare that, excuse me, 
Compare that with the institutions as they evolved in East Asia from very early on, really from the moment that China emerged as a unitary empire, a middle kingdom. From early on in Chinese history, there was a strong emphasis on conformity, homogeneity, and centralization. You're all looking forward to examinations in the near future, I gather. But you should feel very relieved that you don't have to sit the imperial civil service exam, which was a great deal harder than any exam you're likely to be asked to sit here. Apart from anything else, it involved being locked in a cell for days. Nothing like the imperial civil service examination existed in the West. And it's a perfect example of the difference, institutional difference, that I want to argue was decisive in the Great Divergence. The second big difference was the way in which this decentralized institutional West did science. The scientific revolution of the 17th century is a subject worthy of several lectures in its own right. But it distinguished itself from all the science that had gone before, including all the science that had been done in imperial China, because of the ways in which science was done. The emphasis on the experimental method, the emphasis on publication, and the emphasis on the autonomy of scientists themselves, all perfectly exemplified by this book. Benjamin Robbins was, ironically enough, a Quaker. He was a self-taught physicist and mathematician. And his book, The New Principles of Gunnery, published in 1742, is a perfect example of how the science, the scientific method of the 17th and 18th century empowered the West. Why? Because it applied Newtonian physics to ballistics. And once you had read this book, you knew how to hit a target with an artillery piece. This is the German edition. It was translated into German at the instructions of the uh, King of Prussia, Frederick the Great. And it appeared within just a few years of the original English edition. Nothing in the Eastern world like that happened. Even although the Ottoman Empire was geographically much nearer to the scientific revolution in Europe than the Chinese Empire, there was absolutely no scientific revolution in Ottoman Turkey. On the contrary, the great observatory of Taki al-Din, one of the great scholars of the 16th century, was destroyed in this period because of pressure from the Muslim clergy not to inquire into the workings of God's mind. Just as European scientists were becoming free from religious constraint, their counterparts in the Oriental world, and in particular in the Near East, were being constrained and prevented from further scientific investigation, despite the fact that the Muslim world in the 9th century or 10th century had been far ahead of Europe in terms of science and particularly in terms of mathematics. A third difference between the West and the rest lay in the area of law that relates to property rights. So these two documents are interesting because one is a deed of indenture and the other is a grant of land. The deed of indenture was a, a document that committed somebody to work for a specified period of time, usually five or seven years. And this was typically entered into by somebody quite poor in England who would go to the colonies in North America and work for that period. It was like a temporary period of slavery that you signed up for. The grant of land is more self-explanatory. What's interesting is that these two documents relate to the same person. Under the extraordinary scheme of property rights that evolved 
in the medieval and early modern period in England, it was possible for an individual with no property temporarily to enslave himself and then with any savings that he had accumulated during that period become a landowner with between 50 and 100 acres in a matter of five to 10 years. Private property rights, the idea that liberty, as John Locke understood it, was the liberty of the individual as a property owner played a very distinctive role in history in the West in particular in the English-speaking world, where this idea became central, not just to the legal system, but to the political system itself. If you ever wonder why the north of America became much richer than the south, and indeed the center, here's the answer. When the British colonized the Americas, most people ended up becoming property owners. The land was subdivided and granted very readily to new settlers. That was not the case where the Spanish and Portuguese settled, where the land continued to be held by the first conquistadores, the conquerors of the Indian peoples. By the 1890s and 1900s, 80, 90% of North Americans owned their own land. In Mexico, it was barely 1%. Even in Argentina, which was pretty good by Latin American standards, it was just 10%. So, institution three, property rights as part, an integral part of the rule of law. We have a medical man in our presence, at least one, another Scotsman, I'm sorry to harp on because of course, the hidden subtext of this is that the Scots were the ones who came to rule the world. Well, there are exceptions to that theory, and this photograph is one of them. Modern medicine, although of course there were medical traditions in China and India and elsewhere, modern medicine in the sense of scientific medicine did not really become a meaningful part of life anywhere until the 19th century and the early 20th century, in the sense that it wasn't really then, until then, that we began to understand infectious disease. One of the fascinating things I discovered writing the book Civilization was just how important medical science was in extending human life, and not only extending European human life, but extending lives everywhere where Europeans were able to practice their new medical science. This is a fascinating image of uh, French medical researchers in Senegal in French West Africa in around 1900 conducting research. That research was very successful in improving life chances, not just for the French in West Africa, but for the Africans. So if you track life expectancy in four French colonies going right back to 1930, it improves in pretty much a straight line. There's no discernible change when you go from colonial rule to independence. Because in fact, for all that we hear it abused, colonial rule tended to improve public health in most places where it existed in the 19th and early 20th century. A fifth institution that distinguished the West from the rest until relatively recently was the idea of a consumer society, an idea in which everybody would own a great many articles of clothing, and many people would be employed making these articles of clothing. This picture illustrates an important point. The Japanese were the first non-Western society to engage in this kind of activity. They were the first non-Western society to industrialize. And here you see Japanese women using Singer sewing machines to make Western-style dresses. Ultimately, that model of the consumer society, the, the, the society with a full wardrobe, prevailed over the alternative model that Mahatma Gandhi had to offer. An, a, an alternative society in which consumption would not be the principal object of economic life. Gandhi is still a 
saintly figure revered not only in India but elsewhere. But he was a colossal failure. Go to India today and you will not see much trace of Gandhi's vision of a, an ascetic society in which everybody would literally spin and weave his own loincloth. The final thing that distinguished the West from the rest, even 100 years ago, was the work ethic. And this was Max Weber's great contribution to the debate. In his essay, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, Weber argued that there was something special about Northern Europe and North America, and that was the way in which people there worked. Weber had this idea of visiting the St. Louis World Fair in 1904. I'm now going to bring my remarks to a conclusion by reflecting on how the world has changed in our time. Remember, 100 years ago, it seemed like a simple explanation to Max Weber that the work ethic was a, an essentially Western or Northern phenomenon. But that's no longer the case, as you can see from this chart. If you look at this chart here, you'll see that non-Western people work much longer hours per year than Western people. In fact, the average Korean works 1,000 hours more per year than the average German. There's at least one German here uh, this evening. I won't embarrass him, and at least one Korean. This is part of an amazing change that has occurred in our lifetimes. After roughly 500 years, when it was the West that worked longer hours than the rest, after roughly 500 years when it was the West that institutionally had the advantage the advantage of competition in its institutions, the advantage of the scientific method, the advantage of the rule of law, the advantage of modern medicine, the advantage of having devised the consumer society. It no longer is the case that those institutions are uniquely Western. And that's why the great divergence has ended in our time. Since the late 1970s, the enormous differentials in income between the West and the rest have been dramatically reduced. So that, as I pointed out the other night, the average American today is just five times richer than the average Chinese. And if present trends continue, it will be less than two times by the 2050s. Today, the biggest cities in the world are no longer Western. They are, as they were 500 years ago, non-Western cities. Cities like Mumbai, Shanghai, Karachi, Delhi, Istanbul. And that brings me, you'll be relieved to hear, to the bottom line of history. All you need to know, summed up in a single slide. The bottom line of history is that most of the people who've ever lived, which is about 106 billion, are dead, were or are Asian, were or are poor. But most of the roughly $195 trillion of known wealth in the world was made after around 1800 and was made and is still owned, even today, by Westerners. And those Westerners account for less than a fifth of the world's population, but still own two-thirds of its wealth. History casts a long shadow. And although the great divergence is clearly over, and we are living through perhaps the third decade of the great reconvergence, the fundamental imbalance between the West and the rest persists and will likely persist for most of your lives. That's why I study history. Thanks very much. Um, would P Professor Ferguson remain on the stage? Um, thank you for that wonderful and insightful talk. I think it's safe to say that I won't be getting my $100 tonight. Um,
You could Would claim, now, you could claim it. You could say, but I didn't find any of that remotely interesting, or I knew all that already. <laughs> Uh, I would now like to invite Professor Sir James Rulis to present a souvenir to Professor Ferguson on behalf of the Morningside College. Professor Rulis. Uh, one is a scarf and one is a tie. I guess I'll have to wear the tie. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you, Professor Merlis and Professor Ferguson. Please be seated. Thank you. I think the idea at this point is that you get to ask questions uh, or sneak away if you've had enough. Uh, if you have a question, why don't you raise a hand? And there is a there's a roving mic. Let's see our German colleague has a question. If it's not working, you'll have to shout. Actually, there's another one here if that one's not working. Oh, there we go. Hello. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it was very interesting. I was wondering what you think about Francis Fukuyama's um, theory of the end of history and if actually is the possibility that China is sort of picking and choosing and actually developing an even more, more yeah, efficient um, model. Thanks. I, I don't know if any of you have read any of Francis Fukuyama's recent work, but the, the one that you alluded to, The End of History, was an essay that he published in the summer of 1989. Uh, and it was an extraordinary prescient essay in which he, he foresaw effectively the collapse of communism and, as he put it, the triumph of the Western liberal model as the only viable model uh, for humanity. And therefore, this was the end of history. Uh, everybody was going to accept the Western liberal capitalist model. That now looks a little off. Because since 1989, in fact, it's been China that has been the stellar performer of the global economy. And not by any stretch of the imagination is it converging on that liberal capitalist democratic model that Fukuyama was, was talking about. So China's a pretty big problem for the end of history. And it's, it's remarkable, and, and most of you are too young to realize this, it's remarkable how few people in the West anticipated, even in 1989, which was, well, 11 years into Chinese economic reforms, that China now would be the second largest economy in the world, and by some measures will be the largest economy of the, in the world in just four or five years. Hardly anyone foresaw this. Fukuyama was not alone in underestimating the power of an alternate model, an alternative set of institutions. In many ways, the Chinese experience poses a fundamental problem for any argument like the one I've made. Because in one fundamental respect, China is not adopting the institutions that I was talking about. Yes, you can see some increased competition, and there's certainly competition in the Chinese economy. The scientific method has been embraced, and Chinese universities are churning out scientists uh, faster than any other institutions in the world. Modern medicine, check. The consumer society, check. The work ethic, check but not the rule of law based on private property rights. That is very far from a part of the Chinese story. At least that is the way it looks from outside. So here's the question. Does China keep on going, growing at 8% for the foreseeable future, overtaking the United States, 
and proving wrong the theory that private property rights and the rule of law really matter? Or does China get into trouble because it doesn't have those institutions? That's really the test. If over the next 10 or 20 years, China gets into trouble because it doesn't have anything like the rule of law based on private property rights in the Western sense, then Fukuyama will be able to say, I was right. If not, then the end of history thesis looks to have been fundamentally wrong. Thanks. Are the senior faculty allowed to ask questions? I'm going to prefer this. I'm going to give preference to the students. Don't let, don't let the Western students ask all the questions here. Hello? Yes. OK. Um, I'm not an economics student. I'm a linguistics student. But I am quite fascinated by what you've just said, and especially your use of gross domestic product or GDP per capita as, you know, as reflecting what, it, what GDP is today. Be I'm curious because from what I know especially about Western, um, Western economics is that there are a decreasing number of people becoming very, very rich mm. and an increasing number of people becoming e extremely poor and especially in the United States. The, the demise of the middle class in the United States. And so I was wondering what is the relevant, or is there a few, going to be a future relevance of using this idea of GDP per capita? Because it doesn't seem to reflect the actual you know, gross domestic product, you know, if you will. No, this Can is you a, explain this to me? This is a great question. So gross domestic product per capita is, uh, I'm sure, your master would be the first to agree, is quite a blunt instrument if you're trying to measure human welfare, broadly speaking, because it just takes the aggregate output of a society and divides by the population. And that tells you nothing at all about how unequal or how fair a society is, to say nothing of all the other things it leaves out, like whether people are happy or not. Let's just focus on the issue of inequality, because that was the one that, that you raised. Over that 500-year period that I've talked about, in all the societies that I've been discussing, there was considerable variation in inequality. If you had the data, we don't really, but if you had the data, you would be able to show inequality in the industrializing Western countries increasing in the initial phase of their economic development and then diminishing later on. It seems to be the case that uh, when countries industrialize, there's an initial surge in inequality as the, the fruits of increased productivity tend to concentrate in the hands of the owners of capital, not the, not the workers. But then, and we're already seeing this happen in China right now, uh, there's a rise in real wages. This can be caused by demographics, it can be caused uh, by the state, it can be caused by the need to create consumers for the products of the industrial sector. But at any event, the experience of the Western world was that inequality began to diminish in the late 19th century, and it, it diminished dramatically in the Depression and the Second World War. So that by the time you get to the 1950s, most Western societies look relatively equal by today's standards. So the story of inequality is actually one of quite significant change over time. Many non-Western societies that have industrialized relatively recently have seen this early phase uh, of polarization when the less skilled stay pretty much where they were in terms of income and those who own capital become super rich. Uh, but it would be surprising if that trend continued indefinitely. I mentioned this in the talk the other night, but it's worth thinking about. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels predicted in the 1840s that capitalism would create ever wider disparities in wealth until all the wealth was owned by a tiny capitalist elite and everybody else was in the proletariat, at which point the proletariat would rise up and overthrow the capitalists and the rest you know. This turned out to be a terrible 
prediction. That's not what happened. And indeed, communist revolutions didn't happen in relatively developed societies uh, because those processes that I described happened. Communist revolutions happened in relatively backward societies uh, where capitalism hadn't, in fact, got very far. So my bet is cautiously on market capitalism to right itself as it tends to over time. Because there's no point having all the wealth in just a few hands. It's a terrible business model. You really need everybody to have enough income to be able to go shopping each weekend. Yes. Hello. Thank you for your interesting speech. Uh, with regard to one of your uh, one part of your answer, the competition sector, mm. where um, the need for self-governing institutions to pursue their own incentives free of interruption as essential to the progress of society, um, how how do you think the European Union, as a, a trade union and a currency union today? will fare tomorrow and later on in the future? And as because as, I've been reading recently and many of the answers are suggesting further integration through the banking union and so on. And I was just wondering, for, in your opinion, will this actually work? Because that just suggests further centralization, further integration, and it seems to be a, a more corporate version of imperialism, you know, centered in Brussels. So I was just wondering, what, what's your take on that? And will it actually work? This is a, a great question, which I, I haven't been asked nearly often enough. Uh, and you've spotted it. One of the implications of my argument is that the West was most successful when it was least centralized. Uh, and therefore, you wouldn't expect me to be a huge fan of European integration for that reason, because ultimately, as you say, one key aspect of the process of European integration has been increased centralization. The most obvious example of this uh, is the monetary union, uh, which was in some ways the most ambitious bit of centralization Europeans tried uh, in the last 30 years, and has been a disaster, because it created a single monetary policy for 17 totally disparate economies. I've been, for many years, uh, a skeptic about the European project. And I was especially wary of the project for a single currency. In fact, I, I'm one of the happy band who can say we were right, along, of course, with Margaret Thatcher, uh, the late and lamented, who quite accurately foresaw what would happen if you created a, a single monetary system for these disparate economies. It's interesting just how right she was about that, incidentally. So I worry a little bit. And the other reason I worry is that as Europe has grown more integrated, it has in many respects become less competitive. Uh, so that whatever else the European uh, Union does, and it does some things well, promotes greater trade within Europe. It doesn't seem to be helping the less competitive countries of Southern Europe become more competitive with say, with, say, Germany. So you've asked a very good question, and it's one that Europeans ought to ask themselves. Are they unwittingly throwing away one of their historic advantages? Of course, the downside of having a fragmented political system of having lots and lots of competition, not only between companies, but between states, is that periodically they fight wars with one another. And this, of course, is why Europeans thought it would be a good idea to create a European Union. The downside of, of the highly fragmented state system of pre-1950s Europe is, of course, a very high level of interstate conflict. So you pays your money and takes your choice, as they say in England. Have we perhaps time for one more question? Uh, Sir James, I'm not sure just when we should call a halt to these enjoyable proceedings. Well, you were watching. Oh, there's a student there. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I, I just have one question that uh, 
simply what really makes the difference in uh, in the thinking styles of people in the Western and, and the people in Eastern because uh, because you you know uh, from scientific science uh, in West in in Western history they have Newton Einstein which a single person can really make a big difference in like the scientific history while such uh, while such kind of person uh, don't appear in the Eastern world, like in China. So, uh, so I wonder if it is uh, uh, it is really the thinking styles of uh, of the people, because and and I want to ask uh, if, if the thinking style, uh, if the difference of the thinking style is caused by geography. Well, what a great question, and I'm, I'm really glad you asked it. Uh, Apart from anything else, it would have been quite worrying if none of the questions had been asked by a Chinese student. Uh, and that might indeed have supported your, your thesis about thinking styles being different. In many ways, I, I'm not competent to answer that question. And not many people are. To answer that question, you have simultaneously to be able to think in the Western way and, and think in, say, the Chinese way. And that means not only to know the language, which I don't, but to have studied the philosophy, which I haven't. Uh, to, to make a, a good answer to that question, you'd need to be a far better educated person than, than I am. And one of the reasons that I'm, I'm here is, in fact, to try to understand a bit better what those differences in thinking are. I'm predisposed to be hostile to the idea of fundamental cultural differences. You'll have guessed from my argument that I like the idea that when you change institutions, you change behavior and by the same token, you change the way that people think. My sense is that major changes that have happened in the relatively recent past uh, in China are having consequences for the way that people think. The, the, young generation of which you're a member is already thinking quite differently uh, from older generations. My hunch is, and it's just a hypothesis, that we will see Chinese Newtons uh, and Chinese Einsteins in the future. Why do I think this? Because A, of the sheer numbers of Chinese people who are studying today to a very high level. If you look at international comparisons in educational attainment, the PISA study that the OECD does has the Chinese students ahead at age 15 of their Western counterparts. Genius is distributed quite randomly through populations in this bell curve of ability. In all populations, there are likely to be geniuses, Einsteins and Newtons in the tail of the distribution. If you have a population of a fifth of humanity and you're educating them at mathematics in particular better than most of the rest of the world, it seems to me just inevitable that there will be geniuses who get the opportunities that Chinese geniuses didn't have in the past. So although modes of thought look pretty different, that philosophical traditions seem to be quite divergent, there's a, a huge gulf that separates the thinking of, say, uh, Confucius from his Western contemporaries. If it's scientific innovation that you care about, if it's paradigm shifts, especially in the natural sciences, then my guess is it's only a matter of time before we see Chinese shifts in the scientific paradigm. In that sense, my fundamental belief is in the universal about our species. There, there aren't such hard cultural constraints that China can't produce a Newton. And if the institutions are sufficiently well-developed to allow a freedom of thought of the sort that Newton could enjoy. A freedom of thought that Einstein was able to enjoy when he fled 
the unfree societies of Central Europe. If that freedom exists in China, then the Newtons and Einsteins will appear. On that suitably rousing note, I will thank you all very much indeed for your attention. Good night. Thank you, Professor Merlis and Professor Ferguson. Please be seated. Um, tonight's dinner has come to the end. On behalf of the Morningside students, I would once again like to thank Professor Ferguson for speaking tonight. Thank you. Please remain to enjoy the delicates we have prepared.